you're welcome. Um, you work at the intersection of engineering, robotics, architecture, and a couple other fields as well, which we will talk about today. Um, one of our big, one of your big research fields is um, actually construction robotics, but that's not what you're here to talk about today. So today um, is about your work in robotic environments for quality of elderly life. Um, would you like to tell us shortly what it's about? Sure. Um, initially, um, the, you could, couldn't put it in such a way that uh, first uh, the robot builds the space, like construction robotics. I started 35 years ago. And recently, I'm dealing with the space that becomes a robot, or the space is a robot now. So um, also, um, I got lots of inspirations from uh, space stations, because I worked once for um, a professor in U University of Houston, and he had a job for NASA. So I got inspired by this, and I have seen the, all the life support systems that had been developed for space stations in the 80s and later applied. So I came up with this idea, okay, why not using it for assisting elderly? Because just like an astronaut out of nowhere in space, they are helpless and weak, so we have to sustain their life. So the same thing is, can be done for elderly, so they are satisfied and can lead a self-fulfilled life. Mm -hmm. So. What is the difference, because you said the space becomes a robot, a robot, so what is the difference between robots and robotic space or robotic environments? And I think you brought a picture for that. Yeah, for example, here you see a typical service robot. It's, um, it can help you in serving you at home or in your office, and it's also used as a care robot for elderly. And, um, but uh, my notion of... Uh, this uh, uh, robotic space or ambience is a little bit different. Uh, we don't develop uh, such service robots, but we make the environment robotic or mechatronic. So um, the functions are in such a way that, that the wall, the floors, the ceilings, the whole room becomes a robot in itself. So it can help you, it can assist you, mm -hmm. it can check your health data. If you live by yourself, it's with, which a lot of old people do, so um, it's, a, it's a different notion. It becomes actually ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So it kind of also melts into the background and you don't mm -hmm. even, it, space adapts to you, right? Right. And so first things first, before we dive in, this is your lab. It's here at the university, right? Right, this is actually, um, probably it was the first uh, con construction robotics lab in, in Europe uh, and when we started here 20 years ago. And in there, I, I set up a kind of theater stage, mm -hmm. and um, it, it can change in three dimensions. So we can, something could pop up from the floor, from the ceiling, from the wall. So everything could transform into different function. And we are testing different prototypes. We are testing there how elderly could live by themselves, and then we develop some solutions, uh, furniture, uh, different kind of uh, wall systems, uh, all the life, uh, so they can lead it independently by themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's also based a lot on, on modularity, I think, as you said. And uh, that's, that should become visible in the very first project, which you can already see there on the bottom left. And um, let's show that to you as a model. So what is that project about? Yeah, here again um, is one of my experience from uh, the time when I got a commercial pilot license in Dallas, Texas. After I couldn't make it into NASA, at least I thought I have to get up in the air somehow. <laughs> so um, uh, I became a taxi pilot in Dallas and I, I was amazed because a pilot can control a big flying machine which cost 80 million, 200 million euros. And uh, when we got into this research uh, about uh, the aging society, I thought, okay, why not designing a workstation for elderly, which is designed like an airplane cockpit. So if you, in case you are defined to your wheelchair, um, just like a pilot, you just uh, handle the whole workstation, you can scan some product, you can uh, cooperatively work with a robot, and this robot is actually, we developed some gesture control for it, 
<laughs> and then you can uh, 3D print something. So uh, the idea is um, that elderly who don't know how to program uh, a robot can handle it. Now here this man, he is now actually controlling this robot by gestures. And uh, so the robot becomes a collaborative system for him. And it's very important for the elderly because they have huge experience. It's actually a pity we let them retire and the society doesn't profit from their knowledge. So I thought, okay, why not? They can work at home or in the care home or in a civic center. They can still contribute to the society because the social participation is very important psychologically for elderly. So they feel happy, they become less sick because they still can contribute to the society. And here we enable it. This man can do it and we test it with lots of people from just a nearby care home. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine how gesture control is much, much more intuitive than, for example, using a mouse. But made, when you told me that for the first time, it made me think of when I was teaching my grandmother how to use the computer. Yeah. She's really, really good at it now. Like, she follows everyone on Facebook, and she also looks up the weather and everything that she needs. But teaching her how to click or double click with a mouse was the just the least intuitive functionality of a computer yeah. ever produced, I think. <laughs> so I can imagine how gesture control yeah. helps there. And you're also doing um, tremor detection, right? So if, if I have a tremor... Yes, right. So in case some people have a problem with tremor, uh, my assistant, he developed this uh, tremor detection so we can filter it out. So just the right command uh, get transferred to the robot. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very in in important to have this intuitive uh, development uh, because uh, lots of people who have good skills and crafts, then they can actually still work with it. Even because elderly sometimes don't have the physical power anymore, mm -hmm. but here we can empower them and then uh, they can transfer the knowledge even to younger people. They can teach them, coach them. The knowledge can be transferred to the robot. So uh, the skills or the crafts don't die out. Yeah, I, ca I can imagine that that's a big potential for sure. Um, so the next project that you brought actually has something to do with this laser pointer, like right here. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us what it's about? Yeah, exactly like um, um, this discussion we have now and you are holding the laser pointer. I had this idea that why not using it because it's low cost, it's very cheap. And uh, most uh, fall detection systems, they don't work in, in the bathroom, for example, if you have some water around. Uh, we used it and uh, it becomes a low-cost fall detection system because most people fall at home. 70% of falls happen at home, surprisingly, even in winter time. So this is a low-cost fall detection system, but now we're even developing the next prototype and it will be even cheaper and more ubiquitous to being used. Actually, I want to get rid of the robot because I think um, um, it's better if there is no robot. Just for emergency, he should come out if some really fall happened and check it up whether it's really dangerous and then can give some alarm. And, uh, but normally, I think we should get rid of the robot and make the environment mm -hmm. uh, robotically uh, smarter. So what you could see here is um, that the person falls down and the robot mm. detects it and comes pick them up, mm. right? Right, he, he gets there and if everything is okay, um, um, the robot returns and if not, uh, we can call some help. Mm -hmm. Because it happens quite often that old people fall at home and nobody realizes it and after a couple of hours or days, it's too late then. So we want to do it uh, preventive also to check up the condition of elderly. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about falling, um, but I know that elderly people also often have trouble getting up when they lay down voluntarily, like in a bed, and that's what your next project is about, right? Can you tell us more? Yeah, that's very important here because uh, all the devices that help uh, elderly in the care home or in the hospitals, um, they are kind of ugly. And you have this lifting device, it looks like a little crane, it's not nice, so we work together with also with a dis industrial designer from Milano, Italy, and uh, um, they designed a very good furniture, and all the furniture now is like a little robot. The bridge over the bed can move and can pull you up. The bed moves upward, so it doesn't look like somebody is living there who needs help. So it's mm -hmm. very decent, uh, and, and you see here our test persons in the care home near Bolzano in northern Italy, 
they enjoy it, they like it, they like the design. And uh, when, you, when they get some visitors, it doesn't look like somebody who needs help is living there because it's hidden in the good design. It also doesn't look like technology inherently. Like yeah. It doesn't look like, like a robot, even though it is robotic. But you actually have functions of a robot mm -hmm. just distributed and arranged in a different way. And I think this is all about we have to be creative, we have to develop new kind of, of uh, kinematical solution. It's not an industrial robot, but in a sense it's a robot because it is just a different configuration. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, two more projects um, that have to do with everyday tasks. So how about this? Here we find, um, just by listening to elderly, um, we found out that they have different problems uh, putting on their coats, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, my assistants had this idea of developing this device to help them putting on the coat. And it's very helpful because you can't move uh, your arm backwards when you get older so easily. And uh, the same thing uh, we did with the uh, shoes also, for example. And because also not only putting on the coat, but also putting on and taking off shoes is difficult. So we, we just listen to elderly and try to uh, solve the problems uh, to make their life easier. Uh, in terms of putting on their shoes, I think you right have here this you see the device. Uh, it's in, uh, integrated in the wardrobe, and the wardrobe is not just a normal wardrobe. It has a mirror and it has uh, tablet computers built inside. So uh, the health data, which are collected from the chair on the right side, can be transferred, and uh, then you can uh, communicate with your house doctor. And uh, because, especially in countrysides, for example, uh, there are not enough doctors. And uh, uh, also, a lot of hospitals close down in the countryside because they don't pay off. So I think we need much more of these systems in the countryside. Otherwise, more and more people will move to big cities. Mm -hmm. And we already have a big problem anyhow. Not enough uh, apartments in big cities. So it's good to keep the old elderly people where they used to live because you also say you can't transplant an old tree because once you do it, um, uh, people die faster. So they should stay in their environment they are used, for, uh, used to and then they can lead their life uh, happily and independently. So we were talking about um, these different fields that you work at the intersection of and there's one more field coming in right there, it's medicine. And right. we were talking a lot of, about psychological aspect, aspects, feeling empowered, accepting technology. So psychology is also mm. a field which is, I think, incredibly interesting to work in an interdisciplinary kind of way. Um, and you said that this, um, this the, the left device, the left project, it also kind of helps um, parts that fold out and parts that, um, that assist you with different movements mm. that adapt to you. And then we were talking about the inspiration for that. It was this. Right. When I was in Japan, um, I liked these toys. Uh, and the little Japanese kids, they were looking at this funny foreigner when I went to the toy store in uh, Shimbashi in Tokyo. And I, I bought uh, lots of these kind of toys, assembled it. And actually, it inspired me. I think architecture has to change. It has to be transformed and has to be a transformer. I, t I, I took my students to lectures in the movie theater, they had to see the Transformer movies, and then I told them, now we do Transformer architecture. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and we did much more crazy stuff, not that only this not one. That is not the strangest thing he has <laughs> done with his students. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not only just about that the space adjusts to the needs, for, for example, if you live by yourself, you marry, you get children, you move together with your grandparents or whatsoever, but it's also a little bit more of a philosophy for ecology, because we don't scrap and build anymore. We keep the embedded energy of the built environment, which used up a lot of energy to be produced, and if it can transform itself, we don't generate any waste anymore. So it's actually a little bit more than just robotics mm -hmm. and transformers and helping the elderly. It's actually to save our planet from too much uh, using up our resources. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned you mentioned a care home in Bolzano before, so you actually have quite uh, some users for your project already. 
This is in, in Italy, mm -hmm. right? How do you work with these, with these people? Now it's uh, permanently the, the final prototype, the last one we built is, uh, or the different prototypes for the bathroom, for the bedroom, for the living room, for the dining room, for uh, all these uh, wardrobe and so on, is now there. And um, the uh, prototypes before we tested here in Munich, in my mm -hmm. laboratory, we brought the people from the Diakonie care home just from next, uh, next block, from the Hessstraße. And uh, these people were very helpful because we improved about three, four generations of prototypes mm -hmm. till, till it, it, it was working and functionally okay. So um, here you see um, how they're testing it. On the right side is uh, fever detection uh, built in the, uh, in the um, restroom, in the mirror in the restroom. And, um, and this lady just uh, puts on her shoes. And as you said before, we can flip out all kind of handles and stuff like this. So the wardrobe transforms into a device that helps you putting on, taking off your shoes. And it's also a communication terminal to, to communicate mm -hmm. with your house doctor, with your family, and so on. I think that is incredible. I would actually like to visit and care home <laughs> once. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can set something up. Um, but in the sessions, we were talking about how things we do today shape our future. And what's your hope or your vision of the future of elderly care? For example, once, once I retire, will I be taken care of by robots or what, what will happen? <laughs> yeah, I think we will have a mix. Um, all the, the repetitive uh, tasks, uh, for example, the care personnel is complaining about the heavy workload they have and uh, elderly complain that nobody talks to them. So what is easy to, to automate and to robotize are these repetitive tasks that can be easily described and then you can develop an algorithm and then you can develop an automation or robotic system. So it will free the, the, the personnel, the care personnel from the hard work and then they have time to communicate with the people, mm -hmm. which is very important. We just heard about emotional intelligence and so on. So it's very important that you communicate with the elderly. The social interaction is very important. So it, it will be a mix. So the routine work will be done by the, by the machine and then humans can focus on communication and, uh, yeah, and the emotional exchange, which is much more important. I think that's a very desirable vision for the future. Thank you very much for coming, Professor mm -hmm. Thomas Bach. Okay, thank you for having me.